Welcome to Basic Christian Life. The teaching series within this podcast is a part of the Basic Discipleship Program. In Mark 8, 34, Jesus said, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Our hope is that this material will equip you with basic Bible truths that you can know how to effectively follow Christ. Now, let's join today's lesson. Hey, welcome to Basic Discipleship and this series on the basic Christian life. And uh, in this session, we're on lesson number eight. We're talking about assurance of salvation. If you really want to live the Christian life and experience the life of Christ, get it, you've got to have assurance regarding your salvation. Now, I've learned from personal experience, both as a Christian in my own life and as a pastor observing the lives of, the lives of others, that most believers at some point are going to struggle with this issue of assurance. I believe there's one great reason for that. When, when you look at Scripture, you see that Satan is a master of doubt. He deals in doubt and deception. Read Genesis 3.1 and see how he sowed seeds of doubt in Eve's mind in order to entice her into temptation. Read John 8.44 and what the Gospels say about Satan and doubt. Get this, our arch enemy takes great delight in confusing people regarding their salvation. We see in the New Testament that even Jesus' closest followers, those upon whom Ephesians 2.20, he built the church, his closest followers struggled with assurance. Go read John 20, 24 through 29. So Satan loves to steal our confidence and assurance in our salvation. He knows that when he gets us on unsteady ground when it comes to the gospel, he'll, he'll rob us of Christian joy. He'll mar our lives with confusion. He'll keep us from being bright witnesses from the Lord. When he can get us timid concerning the truth of God's word, then he's got us in bondage and he'll keep us from advancing the kingdom of God. So contrary to Satan's schemes, understand this, God wants us to have assurance. He doesn't want us to live in unnecessary and unhealthy doubt. The Bible says this, 1 John 5, 14, these things have been written unto you so that you may know that you have eternal life. So as one has said before, God doesn't want you to have a mere, I hope so, salvation. God wants you to have an I know so salvation. You'll never have the joy of Jesus in your life, and you'll never be effective in Christian service and mission if you're not strong in the assurance of your salvation. So let's briefly in this session consider two important ideas related to this topic of assurance. Number one, I hope to give you assurance by speaking on these two subject headings. And number one, I want to talk about reasons we doubt. From my personal experience in counseling others and in my own personal struggles with assurance and from my study of Scripture, I've learned that there's a few key reasons that people often doubt their salvation. Number one, people sometimes doubt because of sin. They doubt because of sin in their personal lives. Now, I've seen this before. Maybe a student goes to a summer camp, makes a profession of faith, has this incredible experience in God's presence. Within a few months, they're back at school um, and they get engaged, tied up in some bad relationships. And before you know it, they're engaging in sin to some degree. And then they come running back to the student pastor, the youth minister, the pastor, a counselor, a friend, whoever, and they've got doubts concerning their salvation. Why? They had this great experience previously, but now they're entangled in sin and it causes them to doubt their salvation. Now, that, that may be kind of a, a stereotypical or even extreme example of a student, 
Uh, but the same thing happens in the lives of people of all ages, from little children to senior adults. I've seen uh, little children who realize they've had an ungodly attitude towards a parent or sibling, and it makes them doubt whether or not they were really saved. I've seen senior adults who later in life succumb to a horrible attitude or engage in some sin that they thought they would never commit, and all of a sudden they're doubting their salvation. So understand this, sin can be a reason for doubting your salvation. So I want to ask you to look at 1 John 1, 7 through 9, and we'll see some great Bible truth regarding uh, this, this reason we doubt. There John says, If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So notice John's writing to believers who were struggling with sin. There were actually people within the first century church who claimed they had no sin. And John wanted to tell them, on the contrary, we all have sin. And he gives, furthermore, the remedy for what we would call indwelling sin. He's talking about sin that can occur after one is saved, and he tells, tells the church, hey, be aware of this. There's no perfection till the resurrection. You're going to have sin in your life even after you're saved. Not that you go and gladly, glibly buy into it, but you will have sin from time to time. We all stumble in many ways, James 3, 1 and 2. So John marks indwelling sin as a reality that we will all experience until Christ returns. He would talk about this later, 1 John 3, 2 that we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet been revealed. And he says, we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. So get this, no perfection until the resurrection. We will have sin as long as we're alive on this earth. Again, not that we become flippant towards sin, but we have a sober awareness that we will struggle and we will fail from time to time. And we should be aware that such failure does not change our relationship with the Lord. It, however, may change our fellowship with the Lord. So what we need to be uh, ready to do is to respond in the right way when we do slip, stumble, and sin. And John gives the answer in 1 John 1, 9, the answer we're looking for. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So some fail, they fall into sin, and they think, man, I did this horrible thing. It must mean that I'm not a believer. Maybe I've lost my salvation, or maybe I never was saved. I would say, friend, check that. Use Scripture as your guide. Realize that indeed a a, a Christian can fall into sin, but when you do fall into sin, you need to have the right response. That, that's the issue. You need to know how to get clean in your walk with the Lord. So sometimes sin can indeed be an evidence that we aren't saved, but we don't need to unnecessarily live in defeat and doubt when we do stumble. We need to be ready to run to Jesus and to realize the relationship's just there. We just need a restoration of fellowship. That's one reason people doubt. Here's another reason people doubt. Other people doubt because of misunderstandings of the gospel. Read Galatians 1, 6 through 9, and you'll see that the Galatians had been inundated by a false teaching that really contained what Paul called another gospel. Another gospel. There were teachers in first century Galatia who were teaching people within the church that they didn't really have, that the people within the church didn't have true salvation. They were saying, you need Jesus plus the law of Moses. You need to be circumcised. They were causing people to doubt their salvation through unbiblical, unscriptural, false teaching. And Paul wrote to encourage the church at Galatia to keep their mind fixed on the true gospel. 
And so the same problem persists to this day. There are some people who are truly saved, but maybe they become seduced by some type of false teaching. Maybe a cult gets that individual within their grasp. Maybe one of the Christian denominations who don't preach the true gospel, the blood of Christ, Jesus, 100% God, who died for the sins of humanity. Maybe a, a Christian group, in name Christian, who teaches a works-based salvation, that you must do five uh, special things in order to be saved. Uh, understand this, there's a lot of people who wear the name Christian, just as it was in first century Galatia, who don't teach the pure, true gospel. And as a result, sometimes Christians... Uh, become influenced by such groups, and as a result, they doubt their salvation. They wonder, do I really need this extra stuff? Some get tied up in churches that teach, indeed, if you ever sin, it's an evidence that you haven't been inhabited by the Holy Spirit. And so such individuals live in continual defeat and continual doubt concerning their salvation. Understand, sin can be a reason we doubt, misunderstandings of the gospel can be a reason we doubt. Third, I think you could say that a lack of salvation could also be a reason some people doubt. John in 1 John 2.19 speaks of people who were a part of the church, and he said, they went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. So it's remarkable. John teaches that there are were actually people in the first century church who were actually under John, the apostle John's tutelage, yet they didn't have real salvation. They were a part of the church, but they had never truly been saved. So sometimes there are people within the church, even now, who profess Christ, who are involved with the things of Christ, but they don't really know Christ. They've perhaps been baptized, joined a church, been engaged in mission trips, served, given money, told people they're a Christian, but they're not a real Christian. And guess what? If the Holy Spirit ever begins to work on their heart, what's going to have to happen? Such individuals are going to have to doubt their salvation. And there's need for this in the church. Paul speaks of the need in one of his letters for Christians to examine themselves to see whether or not they're in the faith. So know this. You or someone you know at some point may doubt, and you or someone you know may have valid reason to doubt. It could be that you or that person you know isn't a true believer. You've got to examine yourself. So get these biblical reasons. If you're struggling with salvation, or someone you're discipling or counseling is struggling with salvation, go through this grid. Could it be that the individual has unconfessed sin in their life? Could it be that they have some misunderstanding of the gospel? Or could it be that they've actually never been saved? Here are some reasons for biblical doubt. Let's talk number two about important ideas related to salvation. I believe when we study scripture, we see three important ideas related to assurance. Three biblical concepts we must grasp if we really want to fight for assurance in the gospel. Number one, I think of this idea of feelings. Feelings. In order to fight the good fight of faith, in order to have strong confidence in Christ, we've got to have a biblical perspective concerning our feelings and emotions. We, we have to understand this. Sometimes our feelings can betray us. We have to understand this. We can't rely on feelings for assurance of salvation. Sometimes we won't feel saved. I've been struggling with allergies recently. The other day after a long day of work and teaching three different times and a lot of activities throughout the day and meetings and responsibilities, allergies on top of all of that, when I got home in the evening, can I tell you, I didn't feel saved. I felt horrible. Sometimes based upon what we eat, sometimes based upon a busy schedule, sometimes based upon physical sickness, our bodies can get to the place where they cause great emotional distress. 
And in such moments, we may not necessarily feel saved. I really believe if you don't get proper Sabbath rest and take a day of week, the week just to chill as God has commanded you to do, you will in time become a person who is pretty miserable. You perhaps won't feel saved. Just think 1 Corinthians 19, 1 through 5 of the example of Elijah. Elijah, the, the hero of Hebrew prophecy, held up as prophet of all prophets. Yet on one occasion, he was on the verge of suicide because he had gone without food and proper rest. Because on top of that, he had great opposition from some really ungodly people. Know this, Isaiah may not have felt like a child of God. He may have felt like he wanted to die. He may even ask the Lord to kill him. He may have been on the verge of suicide, but mark it down. He was a child of God. And understand this, friends, you've got to pay attention to your feelings. You can't allow your feelings to dictate where you stand with the Lord. You have to stand strong, not in how you feel, but in what the gospel says and what the word of God says and in what Jesus did for you. And understand this, if you're trusting in your feelings and you're trusting in your feelings, remember this, salvation isn't about a trust in how you feel or what you've experienced. Salvation ultimately is a trust in the perfect, crucified, and risen Lord Jesus Christ. So realize when you're trusting in your feelings, you're trusting in a gospel counterfeit. Trust in Jesus. Letter B, I think of this. Here's another important concept related to assurance. I think of this idea of fruitfulness. You could read in Matthew 7, 15 through 23, Jesus talked about this. And he, he, he said this, by your, their fruit, you will know them. Good trees, according to Jesus, produce good fruit. Bad trees produce bad fruit. Jesus said in John 15, 5, abide in me and I in you and you'll produce much fruit. So get this, if you've got the root of salvation, you'll have the fruit of sanctification. If the Lord, Philippians 2.12, has worked into you his salvation, he will, Philippians 2.13, lead you to work it out. If there's been an internal change by the Holy Spirit of God, there will be an external change at some point. So we, we've got to be fruit inspectors in a way of our own lives and even of the lives of others. We've got to realize that if salvation is really present, there will be fruit. So there were times in my life where I've doubted my salvation. I've had those low moments like Elijah. And you know what I've often done? When I get to that dark night of the soul, I try to look back. I try to look at the words of Jesus where he spoke of good fruit. I try to step outside of myself and ask myself, have I ever produce good fruit for Jesus? Have I ever seen him do anything in my life? Have I ever experienced his grace? Has he changed me at all in the past? And when I ask questions like that, even though I'm far from perfect, I have to say the answer is yes. I know he's changed me. I know his Holy Spirit's worked within me. I know he's produced some good fruit in my life and I can stand confident in my salvation. Get this, feelings, fruitfulness, and then lastly, number C, there's this issue of faith. We have to understand Romans 4, 3, that Abraham was justified by faith, not by works. And we, Ephesians 2, 8, are saved by faith, not by works. So many times people doubt their salvation because they're really focused on works. We need to remember that salvation is based on faith. So what we do when we doubt is this. We go back to, have I trusted in Jesus Christ that he was the God-man who lived a perfect life on my behalf, died for my sins, and was raised to save me? If you say, yes, I've placed my faith in that, then the Bible teaches you have been saved. We have to understand that faith is the answer. Faith is the basis of our salvation, not how we feel, not whether or not we've messed up or blown it. At the end of the day is the question is this, are you trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation? I remember an older method for 
sharing the gospel with others. And in that method, witnesses were trained to ask this question when leading into a gospel presentation. The question went like this. You want to share the gospel with somebody? You ask this question. Hey, if you were to die tonight or today and stand before God and God was to ask, why should I let you into my kingdom? What would your answer be? Now, I think that's a great question to ask somebody when witnessing to them because it really unearths or reveals what they're trusting in for salvation. So, example, sometimes I'll ask that question and somebody might say something like this. Well, I've always been a pretty good person. Never done anything really bad. That tells me that person perhaps is trusting in his or her good works for salvation, not Jesus. Sometimes people will say something like this. Well, man, I was in church before I was even born, sitting in the pew while still in my mother's belly. I was at church the Sunday after I was born. I've always been a member of the church. I guess I've been a Christian all my life. Been involved down at the church. I, I'm a key member. I give a lot of money. I serve. That answer tells me that perhaps that individual is trusting in church involvement for salvation. The answer you want to hear when you ask that question is this. Man, I realized at one point in my life I was an imperfect person, a sinner. And I heard that Jesus died for my sins. Because of what he did, I asked him to save me, to forgive me and come into my life. He's come into my life. I have my confidence, not myself, but in Jesus. That's the type of answer you want to hear. Not, maybe not verbatim, but, but that's what you want to hear. You want to hear that the person is trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, why do I share all of that? Because I want to bring us back to this issue of faith. If you're struggling with salvation, yes, there's some benefit of looking to the gospel and looking at the fruit in your life. But at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself this question. Have you ever trusted in Jesus Christ? Is your trust in Him? If you were to stand before Him right now, and he was asking you, why should I let you into my kingdom? What would your answer be? Would you cling to the cross and to Christ? Or would your trust be something else? If it is true that you would cling to the cross and Christ, then you've got to trust in your trust. You've got to believe that the gospel is real, that God's plan of salvation is true, and that faith is indeed what saves you. And at the end of the day, that's what faith is. It's ultimately a trust that the Lord is true, His plan of salvation is sufficient, and that He has saved you, and that you're in His hand. And until faith is made sight, you have to have that trust and pray that that trust would give you assurance. I remember being brought to the, a point in regard to this issue when I was in college. I had been living a little bit distant from the Lord but real involved in a local church in the town in which I attended college. And I can remember because I'd been around some bad influences and engaged in some things I knew I shouldn't have done as a Christian. I really struggled with doubts concerning my salvation. And I remember on a Sunday evening service, standing in the back of the worship service and pouring my heart out to a man who discipled me. And I said, man, after how I've lived the last couple of weeks, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. Now, this man really believed I was a Christian. He had seen my heart and seen fruit in my life. But he just kind of challenged me in that moment. Okay, Patrick, if you think you've never been saved, if you think you don't know Jesus, if you feel that you've never really placed your faith in him, if you feel your entire Christian life up to this point was a sham, then let's just go on down front right now and pray. And you can ask Jesus to save you. You can place your faith in Him, and we can take care of this right now. It's almost like the way He presented it, it brought me to this point where I realized, you know what? I have done that before. I have placed my faith in Christ, and I have seen some fruit in my life. 
And I'm just at a place like 1 John 1, 7 through 9. I've had some sin in my life and I need to confess it. My relationship with God hasn't changed. My union with Him hasn't changed. It's my fellowship and my communion with Him that's changed. And so in that moment, that really helped me. I don't think I've struggled with assurance since then because I understood these biblical concepts and I hope you grasp them as well. Thank you for joining us today for our lesson on basic Christian life. Stay current with other episodes by subscribing to our podcast or visit us online at basicdiscipleship.net. If you have any questions about the materials presented in this lesson, or if you would like to give feedback, email us at info at basicdiscipleship.net. Thanks for listening.